Yeah, so I'm like assuming, but I don't know, like it seems like the media is portraying that like, you know, these horrible Israeli police are just like killing these innocent Palestinians, but like there's more to that, right? Yes, we, first of all, there's no, the Palestinian hasn't died. So that's number one. That's how you know we're not killing any Palestinians. I no Palestinians like, died. Didn't like three teenage Palestinians die? The, today they claim that in, that in uh, what's it called, that in uh, Gaza, in our bombing, Three people died, but that's unconfirmed, and no one's no one's for sure because I've seen the four children. Like, I got twenty. Well, it could be by the time that we're done that in the last couple hours. I haven't looked at the news in the last two hours. It could be it's up. To, it depends how much we're bombing. If we bomb Gaza seriously, civilians will die because Hamas puts themselves within civilians. There is no missile that's so precise that can kill one member of Hamas who's in an apartment building with other with other civilians. This doesn't have hasn't been invented yet. And I've got to say, I'm sorry that for the civilian, that's war. There hasn't been a war fought where no civilians have died. Okay, it just doesn't happen, right? So when countries come out and they're, they're holier than now and say, oh, you've killed civilians, you can't kill civilians, I'm sorry. But like America, give me a break, Dresden in World War II, they, they bombed the entire city, right? Now it doesn't mean that that's what we should be aiming for. And Israel does a better job than anybody else at ensuring that that uh that we haven't that we haven't uh you know bought, that we that we that we try to minimize civilian casualties, but to come in with the expectation that we can bomb without uh without civilian casualties and that Israel should be held to a standard where it doesn't do that that's ridiculous. So yes, civilians will die. Yes, it's tragic. Yes, it's expected, and yes, it has to happen. And the fault does not lie with the Israeli military; it lies with Hamas for starting to fire rockets at us. They knew that they were going to do this. They expect their civilians to die, and they're hopeful that civilians will die because then they win the public the publicity war because the news portrays it as Israel in response to Hamas, or they leave out in response to Hamas, has killed twenty civilians. They don't talk about what the context is at all. Rafi and then Shira. Yeah, I think you're good. Okay, uh, Shira. Um, okay, so does this do the riots and everything, whatever? Does it also have to do with Ramadan ending, or just mostly with the eviction? So, so every year at the end of Ramadan, there there is there is some there is tension. There is tension. Sometimes that tension leads to violence, right? There's there's every year at the end of Ramadan. Unfortunately, the end of Ramadan is a high point of Ramadan. That's where a lot of their holidays happen. Some years, nothing happens. There's always tension. There's a lot of tension because you have a lot of a lot of Palestinians who are usually given permits that are never given permits to come into the old city, and sometimes bad actors sneak in, right? That's usually what happens. This year is is uh, unique in just how much violence is uh, is is happening. Um, you know, I'm sure there'll be uh, investigations to see if if Israel exasperated the situation. But at the end of the day, right, you've never been to a synagogue um, or a mosque in the United States. That has brought that their people that attend and came to pray brought boulders and rocks with them. That has never happened in a synagogue anywhere in the world, nor in a mosque anywhere in the United States of America. Right? When when you see pictures of the Al Aqsa Mosque full of boulders and rocks, right, and firecrackers, right, that are that are, right. When you see that, you know that people are preparing for something other than prayer. You know that this is not about Ramadan and religion, but more about nationalism, right? That's what that's what you know now. Okay, it depends what you come with. If you come to to shul with your sitter and with your to synagogue with your sitter, and you come with your talit and you come with your tefillin, you've come to pray. If you're a Muslim and you show up with your prayer rug, you've come to pray. If you show up with boulders and rocks and make a pile of boulders next to you on your prayer rug, you have not come to pray. Right, that's the that's the difference. So in, in most years, right, so we shouldn't confuse Islam with violence. We shouldn't say just because this happens at Ramadan, this is the time where bad actors will use as a as a jumping point to start violence. But it's a I, I believe that what's happening is a combination of many factors. Two weeks ago, we had violence in, at Damascus Gate, right? And uh, and that you know sort of petered down, but obviously tensions have been didn't completely dissipate, um, dissipate, excuse me. And then we had, then we enrolled into 
um, Ramadan and the Temple Mount problems and rolled into Sheikh Jarrah, right? And it rolled into things happening at the Gaza border. And now we're watching it all come together. Okay, so that's that's what we're seeing. So there, it's impossible to say that there's one thing that's that's leading to this. There's also keep in mind our problems, right? Where we're where we're not, you know, we're not um, we're not together, um, and we're not like, politically. We're not uh, we're not you know we're, we're not as as a country. We're fighting more than we're united, right? Imagine if we had a government now that had everybody together. It essentially feels the same way. Right, what should be happening right now is that there should be a table where sitting around that table is Bibi Netanyahu, Gidon Sar, Naftali Bennett, right? And the, those three people who feel the exact same way about this situation should be sitting around the table now, coming up with one united approach. And instead of that happening, Gidon Sar and, and Naftali Bennett are not sitting with Bibi Netanyahu, right? Joining forces and uniting against our enemies. Instead, they're infighting and trying to trying to decide who's gonna. Be able to oust the other people and outsmart them. So that's what they're right. As much as I believe that Bibi Netanyahu is fully engaged um, in the defense of our country, he's clearly also thinking politically, and that's distracting and it's distracting everybody in our nation. And that's a huge problem. Right? That is a huge problem that we've created amongst ourselves. So you know that's that political reality. Until now, we've had the luxury of. Of just having, you know, like, uh, okay, we'll have four or five elections. What could be the big deal? But now we're watching. Now our enemies are attacking. And this is a big deal because our brain trust, the leaders of our people who we trust, are not sitting together trying to come up with a solution. Instead, they're trying to figure out how they can outsmart the other person. Rebecca. Um, are, like, have most of the rockets been shot down by the Iron Dome? Or? So the way Iron Dome works is that 50% of the rockets that Hamas fires never make, them out, make itself out of Gaza. They land within Gaza itself, okay? Then of the 50% that make it past the Gaza border, only about 15% are actually going to land in populated areas. So of those rockets that are going to land in populated areas, um, the Iron Dome has a 90% hit rate, like a successful hit rate of knocking them out. Tonight, I saw one rocket landed next to a soccer field. Um, so, right, and again, also very important to note that we try not to announce we're not supposed to announce where the rockets land, because then if we tell Hamas, oh, it landed 30 meters away from the oil refinery, so then they're like, oh, shoot, right? And then they can, yeah, they can nail the spot. So we're not really supposed to announce afterwards. So it's always suspect where the rockets actually landed. I saw a picture next to a soccer field. So I don't know if the Iron Dome knows that nobody's in the soccer field. I don't know, right? I don't know if, it, if it's able to figure that out. Iron Dome is only supposed to fire at rockets that are going to hit a residential area. Can it really detect if a residential area is full of people or not? I don't know. Nobody got hurt. So I don't know. But I already heard one rocket also hit a house. So I don't know. I heard one rocket also hit Abu Ghosh, which is an Arab town. So if that, or an Arab city, I should say. So if that happened, I don't know. It will see more as the days go on where, where it hits. I haven't heard that there was a massive failure of Iron Dome. Today. That I didn't hear. Olivia? Um, about the attack that happened in the old city today, this morning. So yeah. after the video and everything about what happened with the man. So I read this article saying that, like the headline was that this Jew went out of the road and hit a Palestinian and like pulled totally out of context. I was like, it's just like, what? This doesn't make sense. Right. So, so, uh, so they, what happened with, what Odai is afraid to, if you haven't seen the video or didn't see the news yet, is that um, a Jewish motorist was driving in uh, inside, and right, right, well, right across from here at David, really, right across from where your dad works, um, right outside the old city on the southern wall, like by what's called uh, Shara Spo, which is like uh, you know, like when you when you're looking at the hotel and you turn around um, from the entrance to the hotel and you see a gate behind you, but you don't actually go through that gate. You always go through the Jaffa Gate, and you're wondering why I didn't go through that gate if it's right next to the hotel. So that gate right there, a Jew was driving by, and then Palestinians started throwing rocks at him. Um, at his car. What happened was it was a bus. It's a very thin way. It was a bus going up and the bus stopped, which trapped the Jewish driver. So then they started throwing rocks knowing he couldn't go anywhere. So he tried diverting away and then ended up losing control of his car and driving up on the sidewalk. And he drove up on the sidewalk and drove up on a curb, hit, um, I don't know if he actually hit a Palestinian or didn't hit a Palestinian. There was a ton of Palestinians around because they're throwing rocks at his car. And then, uh, so then he drove off um, and then they started throwing rocks at him himself. 
Uh, so they start throwing rocks at the at the at the Jewish driver. Um, and if it wasn't for a policeman running over, I don't know why there were no cops near there right away. But if it wasn't for a policeman running over um, and firing into the air and then pointing his gun at everybody, so that Jew would have been lynched. He came out all bloodied and it was horrible. Of course, the media then took it apart and started not the Israeli media, but other media started saying that. Well, look, I saw Palestinian media. Even Palestinian media wasn't so brazen to say that it was a car ramming into them. But other other media, Palestinians just said like this was uh, this was you know Jewish settler. They call everybody settler. So Jewish settler, um, you know, like uh, injured um, after hitting a Palestinian you know uh, pedestrian. Yeah, you know? but uh, but that that would have been a, a horrible story if it wasn't for that guy. Yeah. You know? So that's what I would uh, that's what I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems to be now taking a back, uh, sort of a back seat, I guess, rightfully so. But there, it, what, what's going on with the coalition building? Lapid got his mandate last week. I think he has until the beginning of June. Does it look like he'll be able to put together a government? And if so, would that be a stable government that could turn into a Likud led government if BB is ousted? after it. Who knows? No idea, right? You have a greater chance of knowing this if you just walk up the block and ask your neighbor, Naftali Bennett. Yeah, just, uh, I, asked Yoni, I asked Yoni, I was with him on Thursday night. <laughs> he didn't, right. he went down. Right, so, okay, so that's like the only, that's the only way you can know is if you, you know, like, uh, look, they're negotiating right now, right? Like, uh, Naftali Bennett, Yair, look, he didn't get on Star negotiating right now. They need they need the Arab party to get together. Um, Hamas attacking does not make it easy for an Arab party to join in with somebody like Naftali Bennett, right? That's not going to be, that is not going to be easy for them. So I don't know what's going to happen. You know, who knows what will happen? Um, we could see, but I think that there's just as much chance of Lapid, Bennett, and Saar forming a coalition as there is to us going to the elections. I think right now I would put the odds at 50-50, being the fact that I know nothing on the inside and have no idea where it's going. They're obviously trying to iron out some serious problems. Um, so I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna text, just give me one second. I don't know where our friends are. Um, okay, yes, Rebecca. Wait, really unrelated, but does this happen in the summer? Does what happen in the summer? Like these meetings. In oh, our meetings and like the yeah. Lapid, they only have till June second. Um, no, we generally stop um, in the beginning of June. Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, and then you're all supposed to go on NCSY summer programs. That's the that's the logic. So for those of you going on NCSY summer programs, then great. If not, then you're the ones that fall. Okay, Shira. Um, I've been hearing that they're suspecting a war this summer. Is that actually true, or they're always going to say that after? They, they always say that. every summer. All wars happen in Israel in the summer. I don't know. I think, mean, yeah, you know, it's just that's the way it's done. Um, but uh, so they always say all wars, but they could be war tomorrow. Yeah, you know, like uh, the way things are going right now. So, but they've all, they said that the last couple of years that war is going to be war in the summer, but. Uh, there, there hasn't, oh God. Okay, they just said that they're gonna get on at 5.30. The heck? <laughs> Excuse me while I curse them out. What do you think guys, should I, should I say 5.30 or should I say let's do this another week? What do you guys think? Give me, give me hands up if you say 5.30. Oh, uh, 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 wait, hold on a second, hold on a second. Wait, uh, uh, the box has just changed. Okay, hands up, 5.30, last chance. Not one, let's see up next. I'm not low guard. Wait, Rafa's hand just went down, so four. Okay, and Lil, Lil, no, Lil, you, we, you don't get to raise your hand unless you're unless you're on, on camera. Your vote doesn't count. No, you don't count unless you're, you're on camera. Okay. Hold on. Now we gotta do this again because my boxes keep twitching. Let's do this one more time. Five thirty. Yes. Put your hands up. We've got four, and then we've got Geller's vote doesn't count, so it's only Rafi and Jordan. Okay. Uh, so it's four to two. Oh God. 
Okay, thank you, jerks. Okay, so I left out the word jerks. Okay, so anyway, um, this really is wow. Okay, um, because you know they're not going to get on at five thirty. You know it's going to take them another ten minutes, and we're going to be here for five forty. You just know this. I get up tomorrow morning at four forty-five. Okay, this is not making me too happy. Okay, anyway. Um, they, and this is why, Rebecca, I need my summers off. Okay, so now, next question, now that we have to forever in this, uh, in this meeting. Who's got the next? Jordan, go ahead. Oh, I read that there, I mean, this wasn't like an Israeli source, but there's an enforced ratio of seven to three with Jews to Palestinians in Jerusalem. <laughs> Not no, a no. thing, right? No. First of all, let me, let me just explain why they completely can't make fix. Forget about that, it's not true. It's definitely not true. Like as soon as you said in fourth ratio, there's no such thing as in fourth ratio. That's number one. Number two, there's no way of counting how many Palestinians or how many Arabs live in Israel. I uh, live in, in Israel, in Israel proper, yes. Um, in East Jerusalem, no, because there's no way of taking a survey. Um, we can't conduct a census because the Palestinians won't allow a census of themselves because they're worried what the true numbers will show. If the true numbers would show, uh, and let me take a step back here. Okay, the logic behind the pullout from Gaza and the logic of the two state solution is the following. Okay, and this is actually very important. The, uh, the logic is, is something called demographics. Okay, and demographics is the study of population. If the big fear in Israel is that if the Arabs ever had anywhere close to majority, then they would win the majority of seats in a democracy, right? Because we, we live in a democracy, and then they would be able to, um, they would be able to um, win um, by majority and change the name of Israel to Palestine, call an Arab country, and be done. And that's the end of Israel as we know. Okay, so so that that was the logic in Gaza of we've got a million Palestinian Arabs in Gaza, right? Today it's more, um, and seventeen thousand Jews living there, right? So what are we going to do, right? And if we and that's the logic against making uh, Palestinians inside the West Bank citizens, because then you're gonna add X amount of people to the Israeli voter rolls, right? To the 25% of Israelis that are already Arabs in Israel, right? 20, 25%, right? That are already Arab citizens of Israel. You add them, then you've got four to 5 million people, supposedly, right? And then you have majority. So well, if you look at, let's say J Street, or, or you speak to like a, a big, a lot of Democrats in Congress, and you say, or American Jews that are pro two-state solution, you rarely find this in Israel. And ask, what are, what's your logic? Say, we want to keep Israel a Jewish and democratic state, right? So what does that mean? That means that if Israel annexes the West Bank, they have to make Palestinian citizens, and then Israel will no longer be a Jewish state because it's democracy, the Arabs will outvote them. And if we say, well, the solution is not to give the Arabs a vote, then Israel will Israel will uh, will not be a democratic state. It'll just be a Jewish state that doesn't give rights to its Palestinian citizens, right? So the solution to that is a two-state solution. Then you separate the Palestinians right out. Now you don't have to worry about the demographic issue, and right. So there's two arguments. There's a lot of arguments against this lot. Number one is, well, hold on a second. How are you sure that there actually is a demographic issue? How do you how are you sure that there's actually going to be a majority of Palestinians? And the answer to that is, well, it's based on um, those demographic studies that project what the, what the total population will be. What do you mean by demographic studies? Are you counting the amount of people? Well, the Palestinians won't let us do a census, right? Because right now, it's in the Palestinians' favor not to know the exact amount. It only becomes better for them if it, if it centers around them, right? If it, if it shows more people than there actually are. But let's say you do a survey or a census, excuse me, and you find out that there are only a million Palestinians. And that if you made them all citizens, it actually wouldn't be a demographic criteria, right? So the Palestinians won't allow a, a census. The last time there was a census was a couple of years ago. Um, it was a couple of years ago. Uh, maybe, sorry, like 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And the, the results of that census were inconclusive. A lot of people that study, I forgot what they're called, the people that study demographics, but a lot of people that study it um, came out and said that it would actually be 
Um, it, it would be a problem for Israel demographically, and that's what they go by. Other people disagree with those, but it's projections. It's not, it's projections based on birth rate, based on death rate. A lot of people said that there are other studies that show among people that do demographics that it's the opposite and it's not really a threat, right? Another, it's, another answer to that problem is, well, hold on a second, but you're saying that if you don't give people the right to vote, so then they're not citizens? They, sorry, if you don't give people the right to vote, that it's apartheid. What about Puerto Rico? People in Puerto Rico or people in Washington D.C. are not represented, but and they don't. Their vote doesn't count as much as other American citizens. No one's questioning America's democracy. So if you annex the West Bank and made it part of Israel, but then didn't give Palestinians the right to vote, it's very hard and difficult to make the argument that Israel loses its sense of democracy because every other country does the exact same thing. So, and that might make you feel uncomfortable, but first South Puerto Rico and then much worse. You know, so that's, uh, or Guam or all the other territories that America has that doesn't give full rights to its own citizens, right? So that's the, uh, that's the issue. Okay, I'm gonna go Rebecca and then back to you, Joy. Rebecca? Yeah, like yesterday when I looked up literally just like the word Jerusalem, I'm like all the headlines and stuff were like, like kind of like anti-Israel and stuff. So like, what do you suggest like, is there something we could do about that? Because like I can't like write an article that's gonna get there, but like that's all that people are seeing. I feel like. Uh, it doesn't matter. If for seventy three years we sat there and bemoaned the fact that the media has never portrayed us in the right way, and yet we're still here. I sorry, it's just not my area that I actually care about because I don't think it actually matters. You know, like uh, you know, like the media's we've never had a time where the media has been like, look at Israel, it's the way, it's the place to be, it's great, right? It's every single conflict we've been in, the media has been against us. So, and yet, like, we still have, you know, support, our supporters still support us, and our critics still critique us, and we're not, it's not getting any worse, it's not getting better, you can't show that it's moving in one direction or the other. So, until you can show me that it's actually having an effect one way or the other, uh, yeah, I don't know how you can say one way, I'm not sure. So, I'm not really worried about the media, not going to work. Maybe if we like, if Jews owned all the media, then it would be different. No, we already do. And it turns out that, that, that Jews don't like us. So that doesn't work. Jordan. Oh, I was pretty sure that um, like Puerto Ricans, all they have to do if they want to vote, they just have to like travel to the States. Like they do have citizenship. They just can't vote if they're in Puerto Rico. I mean, I might be mistaken, but. Okay, first, of all, you're, first of all, you're mistaken. Second of all, even if that was true, can you imagine how crazy what you're saying sounds like? No, no, it's a full democracy. They just have to be able to afford a plane ticket and fly over. The fact that they've been through like two hurricanes which have completely demolished almost all residences and the entire economy of Puerto Rico and they're all poor and starving. And it turns out that the, the aid agencies that we, uh, that, we, that we had bring the food over didn't actually bring it to Puerto Rico. Just all they have to do is travel to America. And so all they have to do is get on a plane in the entire Puerto Rico. Get on a plane, go to American election day, and vote. What's the big deal? I don't see the problem with that. Yeah, just go to Miami, you know, or California. Once they can afford a plane ticket, it's no problem. The fact they can't put food on their own tables and they're all starving is no big deal. They have full rights. Just get on a plane. But don't worry, I'm not actually mocking you. I'm just showing you that first of all, it's incorrect. Second of all, they're allowed to vote, just not for their own representatives. So they can vote for like the the, the uh, El Presidente um, of the United States of America, but they don't can't actually have their own representative in Congress. Sorry, they have a representative in Congress. That person is just not allowed to vote. So the person can sit there and be like, it's bad for Puerto Rico. And everyone's like, anybody hear anybody? No, 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 Okay, forget that. If you don't actually give you any power, you can just sit and scream, you know? Um, yeah, they, they might harken back to the time when Puerto Ricans tried to change this by firing bullets in, uh, in the main house of Congress, um, which are still there, the bullet holes. They decided to keep them there, so I, maybe so that Congress never gives their people the right to vote. And every time they think about doing it, they look up at the ceiling and say, like, oh, yeah. Or the time where Puerto Rican separatists tried um, assassinating uh, Truman, right, outside the White House, which led to Secret Service protection for president. So that could be, uh, that could be awesome. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah. Viva Puerto Rico. So, yeah, so that's. We don't like Puerto Ricans. We don't. We, um, I, I mean, I've never met a Puerto Rican I didn't like, but clearly as an American, I'm supposed to not like Puerto Ricans, which is why I deny them the rights. That's the American way. So, yeah. But Israel's bad. 
this was bad for, for doing what it is. Yeah. Okay, next question. I really hope you guys pick up on sarcasm here. I'm gonna sound like a horrible race. Okay, next year. Anybody have any other questions or just out and maybe we should just end this and, and tell our friends from, from the UAE that uh, just so you know what's going on right now, um, there is an Israeli who I don't know and I can look up his name, but I don't really care about the Israeli. Um, and a guy named Eli, um, who Hodaya and Daniel know. Maybe Rafi knows him. Um, Eli, I don't know how to pronounce Eli, Daniel, why don't you help me out here? I think it's P.F. Right, Eli, uh, him. And uh, he's one of my very good friends. And he's not going to tell me even though this is recorded and will go up on YouTube. But hopefully he'll never watch this. I don't know why he would. But uh, we're very good friends. We hang out all the time. We're like really good friends. I can never pronounce his last name. And coming from yeah, you seem really close. Is, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really bad. Um, my wife can get the last name perfect. She knows him also and uh, always yells at me when I can never get his name. It, it's spelled, uh, yeah, I'll tell you, it's spelled P I E P R Z. E P R Z. Right. So go ahead and try to figure that one out. Um, anyway, maybe I'll say, can everybody introduce themselves? And then you guys can all laugh. He says his last name, has the last name, and then be like, you guys are so rude. Um, so he's there. He's taking around an Israeli who is very, um, who is very involved. There's an organization. I'll tell you what it's called right now. It must mean something in Arabic because it doesn't mean anything in Hebrew. Or it's a combination of Arabic and Hebrew and doesn't mean anything in either language. Um, called Sharaka. Okay. So one of them is Amit Deri. Okay. And the other one um, is, is from the UAE. His name is Majid Al Sara. Okay. Dr. Majid Al Sara. He's a professional, and these are two, and they they started an organization, um, which a lot of people that we know, like uh, Floor, some of you know Floor, um, who's the who's the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. So they started an organization with another guy named Dan Fetterman, who some of you might know, called Sharaka, which is to join the UAE and um, and Israel together in more and more peace and Abraham reports. Um, and they so they're right now on a tour of America with Ellie. Around, they met with Congressman Deutsch yesterday, um, and they're going all around. Um, and they're right now they're in Florida. So, uh, and the, the thought was they were supposed to be in Boca at 4 p.m. And they, and my thought was, but then they got they're in Golden Beach now, which is near Miami. And my thought was to bring everybody except for Odaya, Rafi, Shira, and Jordan, which would have been essentially I guess just Rebecca and Shayla, um, together <laughs> together to to meet with them in Boca. I'm sure we would have gotten other people though if we were in Boca. Um, together to meet with them, but then they're in Golden Beach, and I'm like, I don't know anybody where Golden Beach is. Like, I know where it is on a map, but I don't know, like, who uh, it is. It was like with one day's notice to try to get everybody together, and I'm just like, you know what, let's just do this on Zoom. Um, so, uh, and thinking that they'd be able to get on at five o'clock, which obviously didn't happen. So, so I'm just gonna, I'm not even gonna leave it because I don't really have time to stay up any longer, so I'm not even gonna leave it for them to speak. I'm just going to leave it for questions. So if each of you can come up with one question, if you don't have any, then I guess I'll just go to sleep earlier. But uh, if each of you can come up with a question that you want to know um, from, and don't ask these really questions. Who cares what he has to say? I and mean, he's a great guy, but we can speak to him whenever we want. But like the, the big thing here is obviously um, Dr. Al Sara, who's uh, who's from uh, from Dubai. We want to listen to him. He has a great English. I've spoken to him on the phone before. Uh, or I wouldn't call his friends, but I'd say that if I was going to visit the UAE, he's the guy I would call. Um, to we text back and forth every once in a while. Um, he's big on voice messages on WhatsApp. I hate them. So, uh, so that that's that's I say is the extent of our of our friendship. But uh, he seems like a wonderful guy. He meets with just about every single Israeli that comes to comes to Dubai. Um, so uh, so he's the guy. I, I forgot what he does for a living. I think he's like an airplane engineer or something, something like that. Um, something something like he does something in in. They, like he's a consultant for airline industry, something like that. I have to look it up to see what he does. But that's in essence the story of who we're having to speak. Okay, so everybody's got a question? No? Okay, wait, I think like, the question. Uh, well, wait, like, can I can't think of something. Like I should like can I ask like how like what's like what is it how what's really changed like since the Yeah. Great okay. question. What's changed? You can ask. You can ask, like, do you think that uh, the UAE's you know, decades of, uh, of talking against Israel has led to the violence today? Do you think that they, have, they can play any role in changing? I'm just saying if you want to be like so challenging. Do you think the UAE's condemnation of Israel like, uh, and 
putting the responsibility and fault on Israel for the violence um, was not a positive step in, in terms of peace between our two countries. Keep in mind, there is no freedom of speech in the UAE. So they try to get him to say something negative about the, uh, about the crown prince and you're gonna be quite challenged. He was the first guy to explain to me what, what not having freedom of speech means. I, I, I've yet to like really experience somebody not having freedom of speech. Like really not like having you're in trouble for saying something on this Zoom if the UAE finds out. If he writes something on so you ask him about that. But hey, by the way, he'll tell you about the freedom of speech laws. The freedom of speech laws are freedom of speech laws. That's like this big. Like, like you start off and say, are you free to say anything you want? Could you could you right now say something critical about the crown prince? And see what he says. And like uh, like say, like, I think that that President Biden was bad for the following reasons. And then you say, I think he needs to bad for the following reasons. Can you now match that with something about, you know, there's a, there's a joke that Ronald Reagan told. It's a great oh. joke. Ronald Reagan told amazing jokes. Rafi knows this. It's a great, I don't know if Rafi knows, but in fact, he's jumping out of his chair and tells me he knows. It's a great joke that Ronald Reagan told. He said that, uh, he said, Ronald Reagan used to, used to demonize Russia, Russia by making anti-Russian jokes, okay? So he said that two, the American and Russian were talking and uh, the, Amer the, uh, the Americans said, you know, I can walk into the, to the Oval Office and walk right up to Ronald Reagan and tell him, Mr. Reagan, Mr. President, I think you're doing a horrible job. And the Russian said, I can do the same thing. The American looked at him and said, really? You can do the same thing? He said, for sure. I can walk into the Kremlin, into the office of the, of the President of Russia and say, Mr. Gorbachev, I think Ronald Reagan's doing a horrible job. So, yeah. so that's, uh, that's freedom of speech, right? So. So in any case, that's what uh, that I like the people that really laughed at me. So anyway, so that, I think that's one of the greatest jokes. I think that's by the way that we should be doing more of. We should be doing that about Iran. You know, Ronald Reagan was a genius. He was able to defeat Russia, not by pointing out the human rights violations, but by making fun of them and making jokes about waiting online for bread and, and, uh, and things like that. He, he was able through his charisma to demonize communism to the point where people stopped like looking at it as, a, as another way of life and looking at it as actually evil. And through jokes like that, recognizing how bad not having freedom of speech is. So you can ask him, you know, about, uh, about what is it like to live in a country without the ability to, to criticize the crown prince, you know? I'd love to hear what he says. So uh, you can ask him what he feel, you know, does he feel that Israel's doing anything wrong? You can ask him a million questions. Rafi. Yeah, can, can I ask him that, you know, one of, um... Uh, the UAE's allies um, uh, is Qatar, and they happen to be paying for a lot of the rockets that are being fired at us tonight. And what is what do you think about that? Yeah, how can you be? How can you be friends with somebody that? Uh, you know, how can you be? You know, how can we respect you if you're friends with one of our enemies? Yeah, you know, that's so, so. Keep in mind, he's not in the government. You know, he's not a. Uh, you know, I'm saying he's a private citizen, so it's sort of like asking. An Israeli, like, you know, that's saying that Israel does or an American about saying that America does. But there's no reason why you can't ask. We're not getting, we're not getting the crown prince on the Zoom with us, you know? Like, uh, that's not going to happen. Yeah, the guy, by the way, the guy famously has only given, like, one or two interviews his whole life. I don't know why. But, uh, yeah, like, that's, uh, yeah, that's, I do know why. Because he doesn't want to face critical questions, which is what reporters do. Now you're talking about the guy that's coming on our Zoom. Like, we're one of the only people that are going to. No, talk. no, no. He gets, I don't know if he gets interviewed, but he meets with everybody. Like he's, he talks to everybody. He's on social media all the time. You know? So, so that's not, yeah. But, but again, the lack of freedom of speech to me was, was shocking when he told me that. That was really like, it was like two days it took me to process that. Where that was like always in my head. Like, no freedom of speech. Can you imagine that? You mentioned having to guard what you say. Like, I, as an American and an Israeli who, like, you could literally say anything you want, you know, other than, like, we should kill people, which is, it's good that we shouldn't say that, but, you know, but, uh, but being able to say, like, whatever you want is just fundamental to who we are, you know, like, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's not only is it, like, our right, but it's actually, we, we recognize the positive nature of that, you know, of how that's, that's, like, conducive to society and how that that helps society so i think that's uh you know it's, it was very shocking to me when when i found that that we didn't have it you know in any case that's what i uh, that's what i think um uh, okay let's see so now we're just waiting for them to get on it is 5 30. okay we're going to make this YouTube video very interesting. Okay. 
people to watch in the future. People do, by the way, you should know that, that I don't know who it is, but, but YouTube views, okay, the view that, that like when it says how many people watch a video is always lower than it actually is. Okay, I don't know how they do their analytics, but, it's, but if it says like 5 million views, it's actually usually like 7.5 million views. And if it says like 30 views, it's usually like 50 views. So our average video gets between 10 and 15 views. I don't publicize it anyway. It just goes on my channel. So I don't know who's like, I don't know if one of you just watch it over and over to see your own face or like, uh, or other people, and, and no, like nobody comments. It's not like people leave a comment on it. Like, oh, I watched the show and blah, blah, blah. I've never gotten any feedback from it except for like spammers that leave like horrible things. Like there's nobody that like leaves like genuine comments, but somebody, people are watching this. I don't know who they are. If you're watching this, like after this has been uh, taped, so please let us know who you are because we're very interested. I don't know, maybe one of you has got a crush and they just like watching you all the time. So I don't know, but uh, I don't know. I can't figure out anything else other than that. But who knows, who knows? Where are they? Are you going to this? We need the link again. Oh, by nature, I'm a very patient person. No answer. By the way, on June 7th, Debbie Wasserman Schultz's staff has rescheduled with us. So everybody- On May 26th, they're gonna cancel? Hey, 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 I didn't say that, okay? okay. Yeah, like, uh, but uh, yeah. Ah, hold on. Nope, not that. Okay. Anybody hear any other good jokes? Well then, anybody else have any other questions? We exhausted all questions. Shayla, you've asked like 15 questions tonight. Do you have anything else you want to say? Oh, wow, look at that. You thought about it, almost had one, but no. Okay, well, Shayla, I'm going to call on you for the first question with the guy from Dubai. So I hope you have a question. One for him. Okay, great. Good. Okay. Jordan, you had your hand up there. Go ahead. Oh, would it be a good question to ask about um, how the Grand Mufti said that um, like citizens of the UAE aren't invited or like they're not allowed to come pray at the Al Aqsa? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Is that still a thing? Because I'm looking at articles and all of them are really old. But like, well, I mean, I don't, I've never heard of them asking, can you go to the temple not to pray now? Are you allowed to? Okay, one of our one of our big supporters just texted me. I asked her if she wants to join us for uh, for a speaker for the UAE. Let's see if she's, I don't know if she's near her Zoom or whatever. She's texting me on Facebook. So that could be exciting. She actually has a close relationship with a Democratic congressman named DeSoto in, she can't right now. Okay. Don't say I didn't offer. I'm going to do live, live, uh, live broadcast of my text messages here. It would be hilarious if like they were waiting in the waiting room. I didn't know. Just checked. I'm going to make Geller the co-host just in case, in case I fall asleep waiting for them. Okay. There we go. Okay. Ah, hold on. Just 
gotta. <laughs> Keller just wrote, I am testing your theory of reading your WhatsApps. See, Keller, it works. <laughs> okay. And another one. Oh, this is it. We're getting to the car where it's more quiet. Great. They're going to be talking to us from the car. Perfect. This should go well. All Zooms from a car go well. Maybe they're on the phone with Hodaya now, who's on her cell phone. Who are you talking Sorry, to? My friend, she's doing, she needs help with math. Sorry, hold on. Uh, friend that needs help with math. Okay. 1230. Israeli students, unlike you people, have serious, serious tests in their junior and senior year. It is like, it's crazy. Rock, I'm you're just doing it. <laughs> like that, see? And, and then all the tests happen the same day, at the same time. And if you don't grab, if you don't get the test right, then you have to go back to high school um, after the army or national service. <laughs> it's serious, serious. Thank you for really being reassuring right now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure you'll be fine. Really you know, fine. There's, there's a second chance. There's no bet. You can always take another test in July and you'll do much better then. But uh, yeah, it's very stressful. It's insanely stressful. Imagine like taking the SATs in every single one of your courses and they matter just as much as your SATs. So, you know, um, the positive side of it is after you do well on your test, you don't have to take that course ever again in high school. So like my daughter today, who was actually used to be friends with Shiro a long, long time ago in Boca Raton, Florida. So she had her history um, test today, her history book group today. And she's like, she's like, Abba, I never have to study history again. And I was like, that's not good. You should always study, uh, study history, you know? And she's like, fine, but I never have to take a test. Yeah. You know? So. She finished all of high school's history this year. Yeah. That's, That's very impressive. Yeah. And she goes to a very good school. For the record, Shira, I told your dad to send you to that school. He just ignored me. I know. All I right. know. It's a great school. And I still should have, I still think I should have checked it out. And you should have. You should have. I should have. Yep. 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 Okay. Where, is, where are they? They're in a car. How difficult could this be? They're sitting there being like, oh my gosh, the hotspot doesn't work. Now I have to go somewhere else. Here they are. Here's Ellie. Okay, here we go. You guys ready? Here's fun time. Are you there? We see your name. We don't hear you or see you. We just started our meeting. So some people are still coming in. Ellie, when you said you were getting into the car and it's going to be more quiet, you I didn't realize how serious you were. This is very quiet. We were wondering how much Majid was able to, to say freely. Now we see just how much. Okay, Ellie, I'm texting you. How is it going over there? That's not a good sign. Everybody saw the name, right? Uh, now we have a Meet Dairy signing in. Okay, hold on. Uh. Hello? Hi, Amit. Hi, how are you? Uri? Yes. How are you? 
Uh, I'm sorry we are late. We were in a very important, uh, very important meeting. So I'm sorry for that. Are you saying your meeting uh, was more important than us? <laughs> never worry. Never worry. <laughs> okay, look at this office that you guys got. Ellie really takes care of you out in Florida over there. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Ellie. How are you? Good, thank God. Thank God. Listen, we, we just got started, so we're we're having a little some more people coming in, but I'm gonna I'm gonna spotlight you guys in the meantime here. Hold on one second. That way we can see you. Hold on. Okay. And uh there you go. So you guys are on spotlight. And uh what I'm gonna do is um okay, so just so, so my students can know, Amit is the uh is the one sitting shotgun here. Um now you see his ear and uh, and half his face. So that is Amit, and uh, and Majin is the one in the back seat leaning forward, and I assume Ellie's Ellie's behind the wheel, and we can't see him. But uh, I am behind the wheel. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So this is Amit okay. Director, Amit and Majid formed Sharaka. Organization means partnership. Amit is the director of Sharaka Israel, and Majid is the director of Sharaka UAE. And together they're partnering to demonstrate that the Abraham Accords was not just a photo op, but that there was actually a real desire for there to be cultural understanding, cultural sensitivity between the signers of the Abraham Accords. Something very different than the peace, the traditional Israeli Arab peace that we all have known for 30, 40 years, which is between Israel and Egypt, Israel and Jordan, which got us to stop shooting each other, but never got the peoples to know each other and have respect for each other and want to get to know each other. The, the peace with the Abram Accords was found under very different terms and continues to grow and develop under very different terms. And that's what Sharaka is there to develop and to expand. Excellent, okay. Uh, Amir or, or Majid, do you guys want to say anything to start or should we just jump right into questions? I think the best uh, is the, that it will be a Q&A session. Uh, I think for you, for your students, it will be uh, it will be the best. I just can say that uh, uh, well, first, I uh, uh, encourage you to get into our website sharaka dot uh, sharaka dot com. Right, that's the the website. I'm not next to it, but you uh, you should Google it and go to videos, and you will experience what all what we accomplished in the last uh, since the Abraham Accord started back in uh, uh, October September October of last year uh, so you can you can see uh, a lot of the videos from the first delegation ever of UAE in uh, in Israel uh, that was back in December um, so just to let you know that Majid here behind me, he's my partner from the UAE. He visited Israel, so you can also ask questions about uh, his experience. Um, and here with us also our uh, Waze partner. You will hear her from time to time uh, directing us. And uh, uh, so I think you and I will be the best, but if you want us to give a speech, like a rabbi in a synagogue, we can do that also. But I think you have uh, you heard uh, from too many rabbis, so you don't want a rabbi. As a rabbi, I won't take personal offense at that, but uh, we'll go right into Q and A. That's why I said rabbis. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, so we'll, we'll go right into Q and A because we know that's what uh, former high tech people that think they know everything like to hear more than anything. I'm sorry, more like they more than anything else. So uh, so Majid. Well, we're gonna go with QAE. I have a feeling that most of the questions are gonna be directed at you. Um, so, and uh, Sheila, I'm gonna, we'll start with you. So go ahead. Hi, thank you for coming. Thank you, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Good to see you. you. Thank you. Uh, my question is like, when you were growing up, what was your impression of Israel, Jews, like in the culture in UAE, what did you learn about Israel? What did you learn about Jews growing up? All right. So uh, generally, generally, I, I have to say uh, in the UAE, uh, coexistence was available for many, many decades. You know, uh, it's a new country. It existed only in 1971 by unification of all the Emirates, you know, all united together. And uh, and of course, that's uh, if we're talking about uniting these Emirates, we're talking about differences because each Emirate, which is a city today, is a different one than the other, you know, so uh, different customs, different traditions, and so on. 
no, no, not a major difference, but again, you know, people sometimes they don't accept differences. So uh, we were actually taught to accept each other since we were kids, regardless of any uh, educational metrics that we would have, uh, because people say, yes, you had teachers from Palestine, from, uh, you know, Egypt, from Jordan. Now, luckily I haven't, you know, I was at an American curriculum school when I was a kid, but uh, 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 the, the thing is we learned how to embrace coexistence, to accept each other, uh, no matter what kind of differences we have. And by the way, even Emiratis, you know, they're so diversified. So coming back to the subject, I mean, to the question asking me about Jews and, uh, and Israelis, people were starting to question, like, we, we don't have any problem with Israel. We don't have any conflict, you know, as a, as a United Arab Emirates, we have similarities and commonalities even more than any forms of conflict. So we don't have any conflicts. People were wondering, why don't we have any kinds of relation with Israel? You know, I'm one of them. I, I was really planning to do anything to visit Israel. I would love to see it, you know? And, um, and again, I mean, this dream came true uh, last December. So um, nobody has anything as an Emirati against Jews, against uh uh, Israel, and maybe you have seen it, you know, uh, since October, you have seen a lot of Israelis coming to Dubai, feeling like home, walking around, you know, uh, absolutely zero discrimination. So it's so beautiful. Okay, great. Okay, who would like to, Rebecca, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if anything like your personal like day-to-day -day life or like what you've seen around you in Dubai like has changed since the peace accords were signed? Mm, looks like we've got some technical issues. Uh, okay. Hello? Okay, we're back. So, uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry, we had a bad connection. Can you repeat? Yeah, sure. I was wondering if anything in like your day-to-day -day life or what you've seen around you has changed um, since the peace accords were signed. Well, we started to, to, to hear Hebrew, you know, in Dubai more than any time ever, you know, we, we didn't hear Hebrew, you know, in, in malls, in streets. And, uh, and actually, I would tell you, we have a lot of Emiratis, they're so passionate about learning about Jews and learning about Israelis. Uh, we celebrated so many events, you know, you could never imagine um, uh, a celebration of Hanukkah in Dubai last year, right? And uh, I'm talking about 2019, uh, Lagba Omer, which we had a couple of weeks, I think, I mean, a couple yeah, of weeks, two ago. weeks ago, two weeks ago. And then uh, other events, you know, I mean, these are new uh, to the culture of the UAE. It's so positive. It's so beautiful. Um, uh, but embracing the uh you know the coexistence project because we have a project called the abrahamic house it has a synagogue uh, a mosque and a church you know close to each other so you can actually go in and uh depending on your religion you can go to any of these uh worshiping house i would say so uh, uh the other change is me having a shabbat dinner every weekend you know i didn't have such a thing uh, back in the time. So I believe it's a very beautiful uh, experience. Okay, great. Uh, just to show of hands, who would like, okay, Hodaya, we're going to go with you. Hold on one second. Okay, go ahead, Hodaya. Thank you for coming on and speaking with us. My question was, I wanted to know how it is to, how, how is it to live in a country which you don't have freedom of speech in it? Because as an Israeli, I, I can't imagine not being able to say whatever I want to say in, in a good manner. But I'm saying like in general, just being able to, say, to speak my mind. So I want to know how it is to live in Dubai and not in the UAE, not Dubai, and being yeah. able to speak, not being able to, to speak your mind. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, can you hear me? I yes. think it's... Uh, Okay, so um, honestly speaking, I don't know, um, so many people think that we don't have the freedom to, to speak up in the OE, but I can assure you that we have the full freedom to speak. However, we have to do it in good manners. Like we cannot do it uh, randomly, like, uh, you know, uh, objecting to the government uh, decisions and so on. No, that there are proper ways to do so. And, um, and I believe this model was taken from different countries. Um, I'm saying this, uh, Hodaya, you know, as an expert in public policy, 
it's a policy aspect. So Singapore, for example, they say it's really healthy if you have any kind of speech or something that you want to do, any uh, observation, you have a proper channel to send it to the government and they actually do whatever you have to say. Uh, in the UAE, for example, I can give you a lot of decisions that were Uh, the, the... Uh, we're losing you there. And then the government actually, like, uh, you will do this, you know? So uh, I'm sorry, did you lose me? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, you just go back a little bit uh, to, back to the Singapore example. Uh, yes. So again, I mean, uh, you are completely free to speak up. However, it's not allowed to, to cause riots, you know, and we see in some countries, I mean, sometimes too much democracy, too much freedom leads you to, you know, to chaos. We don't want. However, you need to respect others. You need to respect decision makers. Um, there are always proper ways to, to fix things, to make things better, you know, and I, and I believe, honestly, I'm, uh, I'm supporting this because it's... Uh, 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 any problems because of, uh, and I'm not saying we need to suppress people because, uh, again, this is another type of, of freedom, you know, uh, because we've seen, like, for example, in the UK, and I've studied one of my men. Okay. And, uh, and I've seen how the Sunday, uh, what do you call it? Sunday speakers or Sunday, spe uh, yeah, in, in the Hyde Park, if you've ever been there, you know, it's, they end up fighting. And, um, you know, uh, seriously, we don't want to see something like that. We want to have uh, different opinions. It's okay to disagree with the government or disagree on some certain points, but we have to do it in a very good manners and in respected ways. I hope that answers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, hands up, who would like to go Rafi? Okay, here we go. Um, go sure. Yes, um, first of all, thank you, Amit. Thank you, uh, Majid. It's, really, it's, a, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to speak to you guys. Um, um, I, I would ask uh, generally, I would say that we're really, being here in Tel Aviv, it's really, it's a, an honor to have people from the UAE and to, to be able to go there. So many of my friends have been now my father goes there just about every six weeks. Um, but tonight I can show you um, now over 150 rockets. These are just from a couple of minutes ago have been fired into Israel. And many of them are paid for by Qatar to the tune of tens of millions of dollars a year. And I want to ask, um, you, the UAE has full diplomatic relations with Qatar. So is there a movement to, you know, put your, your arm around a brother and say, Look, you, we really can't be doing this. It's if we well, so are America now. America have a relationship. And what he's about to say is also well, America has a relationship. Oh, I think we lost the first. We're, we're back. Hello? Hello? We're back. You're, awesome. uh, you're about okay. to say America Sorry, also. Sorry, guys. I'm say, I said, you know, that also your country have relation with Qatar, a very good one, by the way. And uh, so uh, it was just a comment, but I will let Majid to respond. Yeah, but I, uh, I would love to highlight some other points too. Um, by the way, these missiles coming from Gaza against innocent people in, uh, in Israel, they're not just funded by Qatar, you know, uh, you have Iran, you know, uh, which is really... Uh, I don't know. It's a it's a very dangerous uh, political attitude, you know. Now I want to I want to guarantee you that we're against these kind of actions in all ways, you know, all means. And we didn't have, uh, by the way, we didn't have political relations with Qatar. Uh, uh, there was like a we were boycotting Qatar for four years or maybe three years, and then we had the relation. But I, I, maybe you can notice that it's not uh, it's not the same as before. OK, but we completely disagree if there is a proof and I can guarantee you if there is a full proof that these missiles, you know, they're, they're funded by Qatar. We are totally against that. And I, um, one more thing, we have really courageous. Some strong leaders who stand up and say enough of this you know, uh, funding, I would say. 
I um, think, uh, yeah, I, I hope it's it's kind of clear, you know, because uh, uh, we we don't accept these kind of uh, actions at all. Okay, and uh, and I think maybe Saudi Arabia, if you see, you know, on the other hand, it's a very good ally of the United Arab Emirates. They have mi missiles from the Houthis, you know, from the south, almost daily, daily ones. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, uh, let's see here. Jordan, let me just find you. Here we go. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you again, um, Majid and Amit, for coming to speak to us. Um, I have a question for Majid. So um, last year, um, like the Palestinian Mufti uh, issued a ban on uh, UAE citizens coming to pray in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, is that still the case? And what, what's that like for um, citizens of the UAE hearing that? Okay, thank you so much for the amazing question, uh, Jordan. Um, actually, I don't think that's a proper, uh, with all due respect, I don't think uh, that's a proper fatwa, you know, because a house, a mosque is a house of God. So any single person can enter this mosque, pray freely, you know. It was purely a political a political uh, fatwa, which is not accepted in any religion, you know, I'm, I can guarantee you that I'm not into religions, you know, but, uh, but I can guarantee you that e even Judaism or Christianity, they don't accept political uh, opinions and fatwa in Islam. So uh, that was not acceptable by Emiratis. And uh, people said, look, it's not up to you to make this fatwa. So this is a house of God. If we want to go there and pray, we are completely free to do so. Uh, if not, of course, uh, um, th that's not another issue. Uh, people were upset to hear such a thing. And to give such what, uh, fatwa, I don't think that comes from a person who really wants peace. It's completely clear that the person who makes such fatwa, you know, it's not a person of peace uh, and it's not really intentional to, to create peaceful bridges. Thank you. That answer Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll go with Shira, go ahead. I just want to say thank you so much for coming on and taking the time to speak with us today. Um, so I wanted to know if um, you're seeing that the Abraham Accord is growing and spreading to more countries as the movement gets bigger and as you're putting in all this time and effort and if you see it really growing and spreading. Yes, I can. Uh, thank you for the question, Shira. Uh, ah, I can see you only now. So, um, the, actually, I can guarantee you this uh, train of peace is not going to be uh, stopping. I can guarantee that. Uh, uh, maybe you have seen Saudi Arabia, you know, granting rights for the uh, airlines and aircrafts coming to the UAE and from the UAE to Israel and from Israel to, uh, to the UAE, you know, and they gave them the right to fly over Saudi Arabia, you know? Uh, I see Oman, I see uh, some other countries, you know? This is the time of peace. And I don't believe, uh, and I don't believe, you know, other other uh, countries will support the old ideologies, you know, of uh, being uh, in support of Palestinians because this enough is enough, you know? And, uh, and we want peace. Again, guys, let me explain. We want peace for Palestinians. We want peace for any person in, on this earth, you know? Uh, but again, I uh, think uh, we would show you help, but if you don't want to help yourself, that's another problem. Uh, peace is going. It will never stop. It was done uh, and started, you know, it started from the UAE, and I can guarantee you it will spread all over the Gulf, and I can guarantee that it will affect the peace with Egypt and Jordan. You know, they, they are seeing really a great model of peace now between people, and it will be changed. I can guarantee you that. Uri, we're about to head into an area. We're about to head into a parking lot. Um, are there any last last thoughts or last question or last uh, closing uh, statements? And actually, that's great timing. That was actually our last uh, our last question. So I really want to. Uh, I'm asking everybody to really thank uh, Amid, Majid, and you, Ellie, for uh, for taking this time. Uh, we know that you have a very busy schedule, and we really appreciate it. Uri, um, and I would love maybe in the future we could do try to do this again. Uh, maybe get some of our colleagues in Bahrain and, and a time when we're in a, a different environment, when we are back at home and stuff like that. Well, here's my suggestion. Yeah. My suggestion either is that we do this in Jerusalem or we do it in Dubai next time. Amen.
Amen. <laughs> uh, Uri, I suggest you will, uh, share, you will share screen and show the video from Yad Vashem. You will find it of Majid speaking there. Uh, you share screen, put our website. If you want, I have one minute to show you what video and you can present it to everyone. The very powerful video. You know how to do it? Yeah, I can figure it out. Yeah. Okay, so go to sharaka.com, S H. I'm not going to do it right, right now because it's a little late. I'm going to send it on, on the ah, WhatsApp. Okay, app. okay. Yeah. All right, excellent. All right, guys. All right, thank you. Thank you for thank your time. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Bye bye. Okay, before before we all get off, let me stop the uh, the recording here. Hold on.